Well, let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 15, shall we? Ezekiel chapter 15. Now you recall that there were three major sieges on Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians. The first major siege was in 605 BC. That is when he take when he had taken young Daniel into Babylon along with his three young friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We, of course, know them a little better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The second siege was in 597 B.C. That is when Nebuchadnezzar had taken Jehoiachin, the 19th king of Judah, 10,000 Jews, as well as Ezekiel into captivity, according to 2 Kings chapter 24. Now, four years after that captivity in 593, 3 BC, Ezekiel began his ministry of prophecy in Babylon. Now remember, uh, and he prophesied for about 22 years from 593 BC. So Daniel was in the city proper of Babylon as a governmental official prophesying. Ezekiel was outside the city prophesying, though he often came in and out of the city. And Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem prophesying as well. So those were the three prophets that were contemporaries with one another. Now you also recall that we had mentioned that chapters 2 through 24, we have a series of, of messages, signs, sermons, and symbols by Ezekiel pointing to and speaking of the doom and destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah, specifically Jerusalem, which of course would come in the third and final siege in 586 BC. And I hope you're getting all this. There will be a test after class. Now, as we come to chapters 15, 16, and 17, for you note takers, you outliners, uh, we're going to be looking at three parables. Ezekiel gives us three parables confirming the doom and destruction of Jerusalem, which according to these parables, presumably is only in about two years. So let's take a look at the first parable. It's the parable of the fruitless vine. That is in chapter 15, the parable of the fruitless vine. And here the imagery, the parable's pretty simple. Israel is the vine and they didn't produce fruit and therefore they're good for nothing. So the parable's very simple, very straightforward. Take a look at verse one of Ezekiel chapter 15, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, how is the wood, which is the branch, the wood of the vine, speaking of its branches, better than any other wood, the vine branch, which is among the trees of the forest? Well, it's not better than any other branches. The branches that come off of the vine for the grapes really is, isn't good for anything but to bear grapes. Verse three, is wood taken from it to make any object? No, of course not. Or can men make a peg from it to hang a, any vessel on? No, it's too weak. Instead, it is thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it and its middle is burnt. It is, useful. is it useful for any work? No, of course not. Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it how much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? So as the vine comes up, the branches bud forth and the grapes should be coming. However, if the branch, if the, the grapevine doesn't bear fruit, it's good for nothing because you can't take a branch off of a vine from a grape and make furniture or even anything strong from it. The only thing it's good for is to be burned in the fire. Now, <laughs> the imagery is simple and very straightforward. In fact, Isaiah deals with this very issue in Isaiah chapter five, verse two. Isaiah calls Israel God's choice vine. And Israel was God's choice vine because they were supposed to bring forth good fruit, but they didn't. They brought forth bad fruit. So they weren't a good vine, they were a wild vine. And the only thing it would be good for is to be burned in the fire. 
because Israel didn't abide in God. They didn't trust in God. Boy, does any of that sound familiar at all? Well, it certainly should. Uh, Jesus talks a great deal about this in John chapter 15, by the way. Uh, in John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit. For without me, you can do some things. Oh no, excuse me, he didn't say that. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And the whole point here is Israel, listen gang, Israel was not relying on the resources of God. They were not abiding in God. Therefore, they brought forth no good fruit. And so too it is with us. Israel was going through a difficult time. The southern kingdom of Jerusalem was being attacked by the Babylonians. They were <laughs> experiencing trial and tribulation and tumult like you can't believe. And instead of abiding in God, they turned to their own strength, their own resources. And they ended up getting conquered. And boy, what a, what a truth that is for us. Because all of us go through difficult times in our lives. We go through trials and tribulation. Uh, when the enemy's attacking us like you can't believe, and we all have a choice to make. We can choose to rely on our own resources, our own strength, our own power, or we can turn to the Lord. We can abide in Jesus Christ. Because when we abide in Christ, we're now relying on His resources, His power, and His blessings in our life as it pertains to each and every aspect of our life and our godliness, if you will. In fact, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, by His divine power, He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who loves us. Man, when we abide in Christ, there's an abundant life. In fact, in John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came to bring you life and that more abundantly. And unfortunately, when we choose <laughs> to rely on our own resources, we're not abiding in Christ and the enemy is going to come in like a flood. Well, verse six, this section goes on. In Ezekiel 15, 6, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine, these branches among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus I will make the land desolate because they have persisted in unfaithfulness, says the Lord God. Jerusalem will experience absolute devastation and destruction because they turned from God. And friends, that is always the case. Anytime we turn from God, man, God help us, we're on our own. In fact, in uh, uh, John chapter 15, verse 6, Jesus said, If you do not abide in me, you are like the branch that's cut off, withered, gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So there is an exact parallel, if you will, to the children of Israel, though the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to each and every one of us today, because all of us have a choice to make. We can choose to turn from God and rely on our own power and our own strength and our own resources, or we can abide in God and receive from Him all that He has for us to encourage, to empower, to enable us to be able to stand up against all that comes against us. And what an incredible parable this is. Well, let's come to the second parable. We said there were three. We've looked at the parable of the fruitful vine. Now, the second parable is the parable of the adulterous wife. 
That's in chapter 16. Now, chapter 16 is the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel. It's 63 verses, so it's a pretty lengthy chapter. And what Ezekiel does, he divides it into three sections. In the first section, the parable deals with the unwanted infant. The second section deals with the beautiful young lady. The third and final section deals with the harlot or the adulterous wife. And all of this points to and speaks of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the southern kingdom of Judah, and of course Israel as a whole. So let's take a look at this first section. It deals with the unwanted infant in verses 1 through 5. In Ezekiel 16.1, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan, what we would call modern day Israel. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity on the day you were born, your navel cord, your umbilical cord was not cut nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor swathed in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourselves were loathed or abhorred or despised on the day you were born. Now here, interestingly enough, there in verse 2, He says that Israel, the Israelites, um, were born in Canaan. And of course, that's the promised land, the, the land of Canaan. However, he says your father was the Amorites and your mother the Hittites. Now, the Amorites and Hittites, of course, inhabited the land at various times. But the thought here is that Israel, um, the Israelites, they turned their back on God. And they now were associating themselves with the pagans of the Hittites and the Amorites. In fact, their relationship was so interwoven that the umbilical cord was never cut. And so here it's a picture of the fact that Jerusalem and the inhabitants, the Jews there, um, their pagan um, practices mirror imaged, and we'll see in a moment, they were even worse than the pagan nations who didn't believe in God. So here the first picture is the picture of the unwanted infant. Now the second portion of this parable involves the beautiful young lady. The beautiful young lady. That's in verses 6 through 14. In verse 6 of Ezekiel 16, it says, And when I passed by you, this is God speaking, passing by the children of Israel, this unborn or this unwanted infant, when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood as you were, of course, left out to die, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again, and looked upon you. Indeed, your time was the time of love. In other words, you, you, you're no longer an infant. You're older now, and, and you're of, of the age of being able to be married. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Verse 9. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin or very strong, you know, uh, uh, material. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. It's speaking of God pouring out his blessings on the nation of Israel in their infancy as, as they were young, if you will. Verse 11. I adorned you with ornaments, with bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. 
Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen silk and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. So Israel was unwanted and unloved as an infant, but the idea is that God passed by, God saw her, God gave his love to her, he bathed her, he clothed her, he adorned her, and he made a covenant with her. So this is the the second part of the parable, how God just poured out his blessings and he poured out his love on the children of Israel. And boy, what a parallel that is for us. Because God desires to pour out his blessings and his love on us as well. Not because we're so wonderful, not because we're so special, because the fact of the matter is we're all pretty messed up. Hello? Uh, Now, I'm not here to burst anybody's bubble, uh, but if you are as messed up as I am, and you are, I'll pray for you. Uh, It's amazing that God even likes me, let alone loves me. (laughs) Okay, you didn't have to amen that one. (laughs) But God loves us so much as he passed by. He sees that we're naked and and worthless and, and, and despised, and yet he still pours out his love on us. How? Through his son, Jesus Christ. Through the sacrificial death of his son, on Calvary's cross. That's when God demonstrated that love for us. That's what Paul said in Romans 5, 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 10 says, herein is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Same thing in, in John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his, or John 13, 15. Did I say 15, 13? Sorry. (laughs) Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. John 15 deals with the vine, so it's John 13. My bad. Two donuts for you, by the way. Good for you. And he desires to clothe us as well. How? Are you ready for this? To clothe us with his righteousness. You know, Isaiah 63 says, my righteousness is as of filthy rags. <laughs> so is yours, by the way. But when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, man, he cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Uh, Isaiah 118 says, come now, let us reason together, you and I. Though our sins were as scarlet, they're as white as wool. Though they're as red as crimson, they're as white as snow. Man, he he cleans us up, washes us off, and clothes us in his robes. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul said, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that amazing? We've got the righteousness of God wrapped up, wrapped around us, clothed in his righteousness, Isaiah declares. And boy, I'll tell you, that just amazes me. Because when God looks, listen, when God looks at me, he sees me quite differently than when you see me. Because when you see me, you go, ah, oh, Clark. But when God sees me, he goes, ah, oh, Clark. <laughs> Big difference. You shake your head in disgust. Not always, okay. But, but most of the time. But God, but God, man, he, he sees his righteousness of Christ, his son, in each and every one of our hearts. And I say hallelujah to that. Well, let's come to the third and final section. The first section dealt with the unwanted infant. The second section deals with the beautiful young lady. The third and final section deals with the harlot or the adulterous wife. That's in verses 15 through 63. Now in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 15, it's a very lengthy section, It says, but you trusted in your own beauty. 
played the harlot because of your fame and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself. Speaking of where pagans worship their false gods on these so-called high places and played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them and you said oil. You set my oil and my incense before them. Speaking of this pagan worship ritual. Also, verse 19, my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil, and honey, which I fed you, you set it before them, these false gods, as sweet incense. And so it was, says the Lord God. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters, whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them up to them, these false gods, by causing them to pass through the fire? Now, this is something the Amorites did, worshiping the god Molech. You, you know, there was no birth control, so, you know, they just had kids. And, and, and how to get rid of them? Well, they'd offered them up to Molech with the fires of Molech. And unfortunately, uh, Israel fell into that incredibly tragic form of worship. Verse 22. And in all your abominations and acts of, of, a, of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. Then it was so, after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, says the Lord, that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a high place for yourself in every street. You built your high places at the head of every road and made your beauty to be abhorred. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. In other words, uh, Israel had had bought into all these false pagan gods and, and and they had committed great harlotry. Verse 26, you also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors, and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me for ang- to anger. Now this was true early on in the life of the Israeli, uh, the Jews there in, in Jerusalem, but also as it pertains to the 20th king of Judah, Zedekiah, who was installed by by Nebuchadnezzar after he'd taken Jehoiachin into captivity. And about 588 BC, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar began his third and final siege on Jerusalem, Zedekiah turned to Egypt for help. And as we'll see in just a few moments, they were no help at all. Verse 27, Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you, diminished your allotment and gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. I mean, even these other pagans didn't measure up to their idolatry and paganism. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. Moreover, You multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor, Chaldea, speaking of the Babylonians. And even then you were not satisfied. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and built your high places in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men take payment to all harlots, but you made your payment to all your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around your uh, around for your harlotry. In other words, man, they had bought so much into all of these pagan idolatry practices that they were actually, you know, paying to be a part of it, we would say. Verse 34. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot in that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. Now then, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, 
because your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your harlotry with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children which you gave to them, surely therefore I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all these other pagan nations that you piled up to, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them from all around against you and will, will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. And I will judge you as, as women who break wedlock or shed blood are judged. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy. Speaking of the final destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, I will also give you into their hands, speaking of the Babylonians, and they shall throw down your shrines and break down your high places. They shall also strip you of your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry and leave you naked and bare. They shall also bring up an assembly against you and they shall stone you with stones and thrust you through with their swords. They shall burn your houses with fire and execute judgment on you in the sight of many women. And I will make you cease playing the harlot and you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury and my jealousy shall depart from you for I will be quiet and will be angry no more because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated me with all these things, surely I will also recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God, and you shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. Indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you, like mother, like daughter. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathed their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. In other words, they were following the, 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 the example of all these pagan nations. Verse 46, your elder sister is Samaria who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. You remember the Samaritans, they of course, uh, the Jews married into non-Jews and the Samaritans became uh, half Jews and half of these other pagan nations. So they were deep into idolatry as well. And your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. And of course we uh, know about Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 47. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations, but as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all their ways. As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor your daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Back in Genesis 19, when Sodom and Gomorrah was totally destroyed. Samaria, verse 51, did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. You who judged your sisters bear your own shame also because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. In other words, they were saying, hey, all these pagan nations are okay. I mean, they're not so bad and they joined right in with them. Verse 53, when I bring back their captives the captives of Sodom and their, her daughters, and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you comforted them. When your sister Sodom and your daughters return to their former state and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will, will return to your former state. In other words, God's going to bring them back into the land after they've been punished for their idolatry. For your sister Sodom was not a byword in your mouth in the days of your pride. Before your wickedness was uncovered, it was like the, the time of the reproach of the daughters of Syria, who all uh, and 
and all who were around her, and of the daughters of the Philistines who despise you everywhere. You have paid for your lewdness and your abomination, said the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as I have done, who despise the oath by breaking the covenant. So he, the picture is pretty simple. He pictures uh, the children of Israel, the Jews, as being far worse than all the other pagan nations because they've adopted all of their policies and all of their false gods. And yet God, of course, will deal with them as they go into Babylonian captivity. Nevertheless, verse 60 I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and your younger sisters, for I will give them to, your, to you for daughters, not because of my covenant with you, uh, and I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord." that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame when I provide you atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. Listen, Israel was worse than all the other pagan nations put together, and there is going to be a price to pay for their sin. But according to verse 50, God's going to remember them and God's going to restore them, and he is going to atone for for them and bring them back from captivity into the promised land. And the parallel for us is very similar because when we sin, there's a price to pay. Look, we're not getting off the hook when we go against God, when we willfully sin, there's going to be a penalty. There's a price. Uh, Romans 2, 6 says, God will render to each man according to his deeds. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. If we sow to the flesh of the flesh, we're going to reap destruction. If we sow to the spirit of the spirit, we're going to reap everlasting life. So yes, there are always consequences to sin, but fear not, little flock, there is hope. The hope is that Jesus Christ will redeem us, that he has atoned for our sins. And that's the hope that we have. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, it talks about this hope that we have as an anchor for our soul. And no matter where we've been or what we've done, no matter how bad our past may be, and believe you me, there's help, there's healing, there's hope. Jesus Christ is standing there with open arms saying, hey, I've atoned for everything you've done and all you have to do is ask for forgiveness and I will wipe the slate clean. That's the hope that we have. You know, I love that old hymn Pastor Chuck used to lead us in singing at Calvary Costa Mesa many, many, many years ago. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust in sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Well, real quickly, let's come to the third and final parable and we'll wrap this up right here. The third and final parable is a parable of two eagles, two eagles. Now, the first eagle is Nebuchadnezzar. As we've mentioned, in the second siege in 597, he took Ezekiel into captivity. He took Jehoiachin, the 19th king of Judah, and then he installed Zedekiah, who was the puppet king under Nebuchadnezzar. Now the second eagle is Egypt, because in 588 BC, Zedekiah enlisted the help of the Egyptians to fight the, off the Babylonians during this third and final siege, which began in 588 B.C. and concluded in 586 B.C. So there's two eagles, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar and the Egyptians. So the parable is very simple and very straightforward. Uh, take a look at verse 1. Ezekiel 17, verse 1. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. And say, Thus says the Lord, A great eagle with large wings and long pinions, this speaks of Nebuchadnezzar, 
full of feathers and various colors, came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. Now that speaks of Jehoiachin, the 19th king of Judah, when he took him into captivity in 597 B.C., Verse 4, he cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it to the land of trade or the land of Babylon. He set it in a city of merchants. Then he took some of the seed, in in other words, some of the Jews, and he took 10,000 of them according to 2 Kings 24. He took some of the seed of the land and planted it in the fertile field or in the land of Babylon. He placed it by abundant waters. Now there were two major rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates that ran through Babylon and and that area and set it like a willow tree and it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature. In other words, during the 70 years of captivity, they were very prolific, much like their 450 years in Egypt. The Jews just multiplied like crazy. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots were under it. So it became a vine, brought forth branches, and put forth shoots. Now the shoot speaks of the kingly line, if you will, speaking of King David and so on. But, verse 7 There was another great eagle. This, of course, would be Egypt with large wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him. In other words, Zedekiah elicited the help of Egypt to help battle the Babylonians and stretch its branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted that he might water it. It was planted in good soil by many waters. It brought forth branches, bare fruit, and become a majestic vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? No, of course not. Will he not, uh, will he not pull up its roots, cut off its fruit, and leave it to wither? Uh-huh. All of its springs, all of its spring leaves its withered. What? All of its spring spring leaves will wither. There we go. (laughs) And no great power or many people will be needed to pluck it it up by the roots. In other words, Babylon's going to have no problem capturing Jerusalem. Behold, verse 10, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when it... When the east wind touches it, that hot, blistering offshore wind, we might say, it will wither in the garden terrace where it grew. Moreover, verse 11, in other words, the second eagle, Egypt, wouldn't help uh, Zedekiah in Jerusalem at all. Babylon will still conquer them. Moreover, verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me saying, say now to the rebellious house, do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, indeed, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and took its king and princes and led them uh, them with him to Babylon, speaking of Jehoiachin, the 19th king of Judah. And he took the king's offspring, made a covenant with him, and put him under oath. He also took away the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be abased and not lift itself up but that by keeping his covenant, it might stand. So installing Zedekiah, he made a covenant with uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar saying, look, we're going to serve you. Don't worry. You're our new king, basically. I'll just stay here in Jerusalem and kind of run the show for you. Verse 15. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt that they might give him horses and many people. Will he prosper? Of course not. Will he who does such things escape? No. Can he break a covenant and still be delivered? I don't think so. As I live, says the Lord God, surely in this place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke with him in the midst of Babylon, he shall die. And of course, Zedekiah was taken to Babylon at that third and final siege in 586 BC, and he died in Babylon, just as Isaiah prophesied about two years earlier. Nor will Pharaoh, with his mighty army and great company, do anything in the war when they heap up a siege mound and build a wall to cut off many persons. Since he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, and in fact gave his hand, and still did all these things, he shall not escape. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath, which he despised, and my covenant, which he broke, I will recompense on his own head. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon and try him there for the treason which he committed against me. All his fugitives, all his fugitives with all his troops shall fall by the sword, and those who remain shall be scattered to every wind and you shall know that I am the Lord that I the Lord have spoken now Zedekiah did try to escape he was caught by Nebuchadnezzar and taken to Babylon but here God's telling us look I'm the one that's taken him I, I'm the one that trapped him and took him to Babylon why because he turned his back on God he used Babylon as a tool an instrument to accomplish his will verse 22 Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain high of Israel, I will plant it. Now God's speaking. He's talking about the, the, the future millennial kingdom here. On the mountain high of Israel, I will plant it. And it will bring forth bows or branches and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort and the shadow of its branches they will dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. Now, this kind of talks about the line of David looking forward, no doubt, to the Messiah, looking toward the millennial kingdom. So that is this third parable. Lord willing, uh, next time we're together, chapter 18, it deals with uh, some gnarly stuff. You might not want to come to church next week. <laughs> um, it deals with self... Um, Anyway, you got to read. I forgot what it was. <laughs> anyway, it's heavy. <sighs> okay. Hmm? Fathers and sons, yes, but no. Okay, let's pray. I lost it. It just went away from me. Father, <laughs> I just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, these few minutes together. And Lord, just uh, to study your word. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for uh, your spirit that just opens our hearts to your truth. And Lord, I, I pray that through these parables, Lord, that uh, we would learn some valuable life lessons for us. So let them sink deep into our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>